Welcome to Biostatistics and Biomedical Research, Session 7. Today we're going to talk about uh, several study design issues, especially related to estimating one thing or comparing two things. We'll talk a little bit more about ordinal endpoints and also crossover studies. Uh, recall that there are multiple ways to take part in the session. If you're watching it live, uh, you can uh, set the uh, YouTube chat to the live option so that you'll see the last uh, messages first. Please feel free to, to enter your questions or comments. Uh, if you're watching the session uh, later, you can click the option to do the live chat uh, replay uh, that shows what was going on in the chat as, as the session proceeded. Or offline, you can go to data methods and this is the URL that will get you to the uh, data methods discussion area specifically for a given session. Uh, so if you were in session seven now, where this will end in BBR seven. We're in the BBR notes, chapter five, section 12. Um, and we're going to talk about some more uh, study design considerations. Uh, one of the key questions to ask yourself is whether you're doing an estimation study or a hypothesis testing study. Uh, I've never actually seen a case where hypothesis testing was what the investigators actually wanted to do. Uh, every study I've been involved in has been really an estimation study um, disguised as a hypothesis testing study. Um, and and the way that you uh, calculate sample size uh, will depend on whether you're using a power calculation or a precision calculation, the latter being more appropriate for an estimation study. Uh, you need to consider the estimation of the quantity of interest on the relevant scale. Um, next we go into uh, sizing a pilot study. Uh, pilot studies are uh, different than uh, regular studies in that they really don't have the information content to be able to estimate uh, key associations or treatment effects, but they're dealing with feas feasibility, uh, working out kinks in measurement instruments and questionnaires and so on. Uh, and to estimate variability, that will allow you to calculate a sample size for uh, the real study. Uh, now, one way to look at variability that's useful for considering a pilot study is uh, what is the margin of error in estimating a standard deviation or a variance when your outcome variable is continuous. And so um, the multiplicative margin of error comes from the confidence limits uh, for uh, an unknown variance or standard deviation. And this applies to a continuous response variable. And for now, we're considering response variables that have a symmetric distribution so that the standard deviation applies. Now, this is the formula 5.1 for getting the 95% confidence interval, assuming a normal distribution, a confidence interval for sigma squared. And you can solve uh, using that formula uh, for the the multiplicative margin of error for estimating sigma, in other words, uh, estimating the standard deviation so with, with some sort of quote 95% confidence, uh, you're not off by a factor more than the multiplicative margin of error in either direction. That's why we're taking the maximum in, in this formula here. So the R code for doing that calculation is very, very simple. And then the results are, are here. Um, and so you can see that your margin of error for, for estimating uh, the unknown standard deviation using the sample standard deviation is going to go down, as you might expect, as the sample size goes up. If you quadruple the sample size, you'll cut the multiplicative margin of error in half. Um, and so if you had only, uh, let's say, 30 subjects, um, your multiplicative margin of error is going to be... Um, uh, not very good. You see it's, it's something like 1.3. Of course, if you had 10 subjects, you can easily be off by a factor of 2 in estimating the standard deviation and either too low or too high. And so you can ask yourself, um, what sort of sample size is needed to estimate the variability to within a certain multiplicative margin of error? Uh, and so if you had only 20 subjects, you're going to nail down the 
unknown standard deviation only to within a factor of 1.46. Uh, that might be all that you can measure, all that you can sample. Uh, and if you're doing a power calculation on the basis of that estimate of sigma, uh, you might be more honest by using some sort of upper confidence interval for sigma rather than the point estimate you get with such a high margin of error. Uh, next we turn to uh, the comparative studies and effect sizes and a lot of investigators have been taught uh, to take an easy way out that Cohen had popularized uh, which is a standardized effect size. Uh, how many, uh, how much change do you want to detect in standard deviation units? And uh, I think most statisticians are really shying away from that approach now and really, really do not recommend it because it's not on a scale that's relevant to anyone. It's on a how much do subjects disagree with each other scale. It's not on a physiologic, biologic, or clinical or public health scale. And it has the odd property that if you were to increase the noise in the data, the purported clinically important difference to detect will increase proportionately. Uh, and that's just uh, another way of saying that the effect that we want to be able to detect, it's not based on how much noise there is in the data. It should be based on what does that effect mean to the subjects or to the biology. So stay with real units. And of course, when you get into binary endpoint, uh, we have things like odds ratios and hazard ratios. Now, what is the choice of the effect size, given that you're convinced that it should be on some clinically relevant scale or biologically relevant scale? What is the effect size that you want to use, say, in a power calculation? Uh, it should be the clinically or biologically relevant effect one would regret missing. Um, and Stephen Sin has written about this in a very beautiful way. You can go to this link here to learn more, and I highly encourage you to go to that, um, that um, article by Stephen. Uh, so some of the key issues to know in effect size choice is that never make the very common mistake, I see this even by very senior investigators, of choosing an effect size to detect that was the effect that was observed in previous data. So that has absolutely nothing to do with what is the biologically relevant effect that you don't want to miss. And most uh, cited previous studies were over-optimistic in the effect they observed. Many of them are not even randomized studies, and so the effect could be very biased. So the effect you want to detect is not a difference that was observed before, it's not a difference that you believe to be true. It's the difference you would not like to miss. And it needs to be clinically relevant to patients or at least to physiology and biology. And the effect that you want to power a study for is uh, not greater than clinically relevant. So I've seen it very often the case that the effect size is double what would be called clinically relevant to a patient. And the horrible effect of that is if something is only clinically relevant and you powered the study to detect twice clinically relevant effect, you're left with nothing because you're, uh, you'll miss a clinically relevant effect and your confidence interval will be so wide that you really don't know much except that the money was spent. So the choice of the effect size is very important if you're doing a power calculation uh, or a Bayesian power calculation. And of course, if you're doing a precision calculation, the choice of the precision that you want to achieve in terms of margin of error is likewise very important. So now we turn to a really different subject, which is what happens when you have multiple things that you're interested in estimating, multiple estimates. And so um, there is a lot of confusion in practice and in the literature about how to deal with multiple outcomes, multiple response variables, and there's a lot of investigators and frequent statisticians who believe that you need to control a family-wise error probability, such as what's the probability of asserting at least one positive result when all of the results are really negative. Uh, so if all the population effects for all, all the endpoints are zero, 
what's the chance of uh, asserting an effect on at least one of those? And so you can adjust the alpha level for the individual comparisons uh, so that you can preserve the overall type 1 error um, or, and you can differentially spin alpha. So you might decide to spin alpha 0.04 to increase the power for a specific endpoint and divide the, the other alpha 0.01 if you're using a silly 0.05 level uh, test or overall uh, error rate. Uh, divide that among uh, multiple secondary outcomes. There's also some complicated closed testing procedures uh, where um, you test later hypotheses at a less stringent alpha if the earlier hypotheses were rejected. Uh, the bad news about multiplicity adjustments is there's no statistical philosophy that really drives the choice of the multiplicity adjustment uh, selection. It's, it's all ad hoc, it's very arbitrary, it depends on the intentions of the investigators, um, and it really affects the interpretation of the study and creates a lot of controversy. Cook and Farewell had a rational approach to this, in my view, uh, where they said if you really have more than one question and you wish to answer the questions on their own, in other words, you want to interpret the effect of a drug in reducing the probability of stroke separately from interpreting the effect in how the drug reduced the probability of death, there's really no need for a multiplicity adjustment. And that's especially true if you have a strong pre-specified priority ordering for the hypotheses uh, that you state in advance. So you may have three hypotheses about efficacy uh, for endpoints in a clinical trial uh, sorted from the most important to the least important, overall mortality, cardiovascular mortality, cardiovascular death, or myocardial infarction unioned together, for example, the time to the first of these two events. And if the researcher always reports all of the results in context in this particular pre-specified order, each p-value can stand on its own. And in my mind, this is more respectful of the rules of evidence. And rules of evidence dictate that the evidence for one thing uh, is not necessarily influenced by whether you looked at a different thing. So um, you, uh, by contrast, if you had a very exploratory way of doing a study so that in essence you wanted to make a report that there exists an endpoint for which this drug improved patient outcomes. Uh, that's a very non-pre-specified way of going about uh, looking at these multiple estimands. Um, and if you want to show that there exists an endpoint that's benefited by the treatment without saying ahead of time which one it might be, then you should expect to do a very conservative adjustment, such as using Bonferroni's inequality, for example, multiplying the p-values by the number of opportunities. Uh, so let's consider a study that has four efficacy endpoints and corresponding p-values in a given pre-specified priority order. Uh, so we've got all-cause mortality, where the p-value is 0.09, stroke, where the p-value is 0.01, myocardial infarction, 0.06, hospitalization, 0.11. What you should be able to state about that? Well, the New England Journal of Medicine would typically say that since you didn't hit your first endpoint, the p-value is 0.09, you can't even unveil to the readers what the p-values were for the other three endpoints. This is uh, an amazing, crazy policy uh, that really is almost unethical to me to spend so much money on a study and not be able to tell the readers more about the results. Uh, so I think it's okay to quantify evidence against each of these four null hypotheses if you report all four in the context using the pre-specified order with separate interpretations. Uh, for example, when we're uh, harping about the benefit of the drug on stroke, uh, we have to have this 0.09 uh, remembered. It has to be in context. You can't just write a paper about this and not mention the 0.09. So what would be a reasonable conclusion from such a study? Well, with the current sample size, there's little evidence to reject the supposition that the treatment does not alter mortality. There is some evidence against the supposition that treatment does not lower uh, 
the rate of stroke, and so on. Um, and contrast that with the purely exploratory mode, there exists an endpoint for which treatment is effective where we would expect to take a multiplicity hit. Now, Bayesian analysis would have a different way of going about it that doesn't even have a way to consider multiplicity nor a need to it because the calculations are on the unknown parameters and not on the data, data extremes. So the Bayesian statement might be treatment probably 0.92 lowers mortality, probably 0.995 probability lowers the rate of stroke, probably 0.96 lowers the rate of myocardial infarction, and probably 0.96 lowers the hospitalization. So those are all posterior probabilities, and if you were a betting person, uh, you would win money by betting on the treatment lowering mortality. Uh, statistical significance, which is on the data randomness scale, is not really the basis for placing bets and making good decisions, in my view. What's another way to do this? Well, let's uh, return to something we've talked about in an earlier session, which is creating an ordinal endpoint that captures the severity of the outcome in a way that's relevant to patients, so that you're going to put your bets on the treatment doing the most good uh, on the most important outcome, or at least doing as much good on the most important outcome as it does on the least important outcome. So we're going to create a five or more level ordinal endpoint and use the worst event as the response variable. So Y of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 corresponds to no event, hospitalization, myocardial infarction, stroke, or death. So how might you interpret that? So remember the context now. We're not having a lot of separate comparisons. We could do those as a second step to isolate myocardial infarction, for example, but we're trying to get an overall comparison of efficacy after the investigators have gone on record as saying which type of event is worse than which other type of event. So the first interpretation you might get which is a general way to say what happens with an ordinal analysis, especially, say, with a proportional odds model, Wilcoxon test, treatment lowered the odds of an outcome or a worse outcome by a factor of 0.8. So that is um, a very honest statement. Some people will find it a little bit harder to interpret because you're having this or worse in the statement. Um, equally good, though, is this interpretation. The chance of getting an MI stroke or death with treatment is estimated at 0.167, um, and for control is estimated as a higher probability of 0.2, and then the chance of stroke or death, which comes from this odds ratio that's above, uh, and the odds ratio is assumed to apply to all the different events, the chance of getting a stroke or dying is 0.082 if you're on the new treatment and 0.1 if you're on control. And likewise, you can calculate the chance of death on both treatments. Those probabilities all come from one model by using different uh, cutoffs on, on the events that you're pooling that you're calculating the cumulative probability of. Now, the Bayesian statement might say the probability that the treatment is beneficial um, is the probability the odds ratio is less than 1, which is, for example, 0.998. Uh, so you're going to get more power from using the odds ratio, which also drives these other calculations here. We covered in an earlier session how the properties of ordinal scales relate to power. You want to have as many uh, levels of the scale as you can, and you would like to have not one or two levels just dominating everything with a very high frequency of the outcome. So now we go into some big picture items on study design. All important is choosing the right thing to estimate or the right question to answer, to think very hard about subject selection or animal selection in the study, um, Decide whether you're doing a pilot study or a more definitive study. A uh, pilot study, as we said, is not to nail down the effect of an intervention. It's to show that you can conduct the study. You can enroll enough subjects per month and so on. You can make the measurements. The measurements are accurate enough. Power is not relevant. Uh, margin of error may be relevant. Um, 
and this is um, the comment about designing the study to um, to uh, achieve a certain margin of error, say, in estimating the variability of a continuous y. That's what we talked about before. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, which is covered in this footnote, this relates to an earlier point, is when you have multiple targets of a study, uh, you can get evidence for, for each of the targets, such as stroke, heart attack, and then Bayes can give you something really different, which is a summary of all the targets what is the expected number of targets that are achieved by this new drug? That's just the sum of all the posterior probabilities. So in the example we had above, uh, we would summarize that trial as saying we had four efficacy targets and we're estimating that we hit 3.8 of those targets. So that's just a side issue not related to this uh, current discussion, but I forgot to discuss that earlier. So when you're designing the study, you want to make sure that the design could answer the question if the sample size was a million animals or a million subjects. And then you need to decide something that most researchers take for granted, but you really sometimes have freedom in this. Uh, are you required to have a fixed sample size? So if your budgeting is flexible, you're not always required to have a fixed sample size. You might just have a maximum sample size and you might have an expected sample size, which is going to be less than the maximum. If the budgeting is flexible, you can use a fully sequential design and stop when the evidence is adequate. And for a fixed budget or study duration, you need to be very, very realistic about the effect size. If you're doing a sequential study, you don't have to know as much. Uh, if there's an inadequate budget for detecting the minimally clinically important effect with a high probability, you need to be very realistic about the study's likely yield. This to me is the most honest and simple way to be realistic. What is the yield of the study? We can quote the expected margin of error for the primary estimate. The next best thing is to compute the power that you'll achieve with the limited sample size that you're able to acquire. Next, you need to choose a response variable that answers the question of interest, has the greatest frequentist or Bayesian power. Uh, so let's suppose you had uh, inability to function physically on a 0 to 100 scale, where 0 means uh, perfectly physically able to do any activity, 100 means not able to do anything and must be in the bed all the time. Uh, and then you might have a complexity that some patients will be too sick to even have their function assessed, and then some patients will die. Uh, so you could define your scale as 0 to 100 with overrides. 101 is too sick to be tested, um, too frail, for example, and 102 could be death. And those numbers are arbitrary. You could do 1,001 and 10,000 here. You're going to get the same analysis treating the outcome as ordinal. Then if you analyze that with proportional odds model, you have a very powerful uh, uh, analysis. And what would be your interpretation in a study design like that? Well, you would say that your primary endpoint is the degree of functional disability penalized by death or being physically unable to be assessed. And the proportional odds model would provide an overall odds ratio for comparing treatment B to treatment A, which is the ratio of odds of an outcome level J or worse and that odds ratio by the proportional odds assumption is assumed to be the same for treatment B to treatment A, no matter what level of uh, functional disability or worse you're currently talking about. You can also use the model to estimate the median disability as a function of treatment, where the sickness or death will shift the median to the right uh, just a little bit. So ordinal analysis turns out to be increasingly more important and, and is a very flexible way uh, to analyze things. You can also summarize uh, the results of the study we just talked about by calculating for each treatment the estimated probability that a patient has level 50 functional disability or worse, where or worse means 51 to 100, too sick or dead. And so that's a cumulative probability that includes level 50 or worse. And that's a function of the overall odds ratio.
as well as the incidences of the various outcomes. Uh, you can use multiple measurements over time, whether you have an ordinal outcome, continuous or binary, uh, and that will increase the power and precision and allow you to answer more questions such as what is the trajectory or how long does a treatment effect last. The greatest power that you will get comes from having a continuous response variable or an ordinal response with many well-populated levels uh, where the Y variable is also measured at baseline and is adjusted for as a covariate. And it's best to allow for a smooth nonlinear effect because not only is it often the case that the slope of the baseline is not one as a change score would assume, but it's not even a linear relationship with the follow-up value. Never ever use change from baseline as the response variable unless you're using the weakest of all designs, which is a pre-post design in a non-randomized study. If a treatment is short-term and wears off, you can fully use each subject as a own control using a randomized crossover study. If you're not doing a crossover study, but you're using a, a more frequently used parallel group randomized study, you need to accurately collect key baseline variables that can be adjusted for. Uh, balance is completely irrelevant, but this is to explain outcome heterogeneity to give you more power and precision. And of course, for an observational study, the burden on collecting baseline variables goes up exponentially because you need to collect things that are not just predictive of outcome in a big way, but things that might be uh, related to treatment uh, by indication confounding. You don't want to rationalize that variables available in an existing data set are adequate. So always ask the investigators which variables might possibly be used for treatment selection in the observational arena and then go and see if your data set that you're going to use actually has those measured and if it doesn't you might want to abandon that particular study you would need to have the variables measured or things that are highly correlated with those variables measured. Use good research data management practice such as using REDCap that allows for extensive data quality checking. Um, don't forget there's many other issues related to subject selection, ethics, good clinical practice, good animal practice, and there is a general book designing clinical research by Hulley et al that is very recommended uh, before you launch a study. So we're going to uh, revisit the one sample t-test in preparation for a crossover study um, and the description we're going to use is a study of uh, uh, sleep inducing uh, drugs um, and it's, it's going to be a crossover study in which each, each subject receives a placebo run-in period and then uh, they're randomized to receive either drug 1 or rug, drug 2. Uh, we don't know from the uh, scant uh, description of this data set, which is the sleep data set built into R, uh, whether the investigator actually randomized the order of treatments, but it's mandatory to do so, so I hope the investigator did. The dependent variable here is the number of hours of increased sleep when compared to the placebo run-in period. Um, now this is using a change score from a period that's not used in the crossover study and a change score makes a whole lot of assumptions so you need to be a little bit aware of those assumptions. And so we're going to assume drug 1 is given in subjects, drug 2 is given to the same in subjects and we're going to ask the question, is drug 1 or drug 2 more effective at increasing sleep? So our neural hypothesis is the mean difference between the two drugs in the unknown population is zero, and the difference is going to be the, the, the hours of sleep compared to run-in period for drug 1 minus um, the uh, amount of uh, increase from placebo run-in period to drug 2. Uh, so we're not actually using the placebo period except for adjusting for outcome heterogeneity in this different score. Our alternative hypothesis is anything that's not zero in either direction, um, and that's sort of pretending we would have been interested in a drug that makes it worse, uh, it makes your sleep worse, even though we're not. 
but it's very typical to do two-tailed tests. And so what are some of the power and sample size issues? Uh, well, let's suppose there was a pilot study or previous research that shows the standard deviation of the difference in hours of sleep is 1.2 hours. What is the number of subjects you need for several values of the effect size delta, which is the absolute difference in mu1 and mu2, with 0.9 power and a type 1 error probability of 0.05? So those calculations are here, and so um, if you wanted to detect a difference of a half an hour, uh, you would need 62 subjects. Uh, if you wanted to detect a difference of a whole hour, you would need only 16 subjects, and a difference of two hours, which would be a whopping difference, you could get by with only five subjects and detect that, if your standard deviation estimate uh, is accurate. Uh, so if, if you increase sleep by 1.5 hours in reality, you would have a probability of 0.9 of detecting that kind of a difference with uh, only eight subjects. Now this is more powerful than a two-sample t-test, uh, which would need 10 subjects in each group for a delta of a huge delta of three hours. So by using each subject as its own control, it's like adjusting for infinitely many covariates. Now what about the data that we actually collected in this sleep data set in R? Here's the data set for 10 subjects. Uh, here's the, uh, the change in hours of sleep from the placebo running period if you were given drug one, uh, and then if you were given drug two. So this is in two different periods on the same patient. And if we take the difference of drug two minus drug one, we get those differences. Um, and the mean difference is 1.5 hour, hours, the standard deviation is 1.2. Um, and so uh, we can show the data in this figure, and it's, it's good when you have paired data to actually connect the pair so you can see uh, which measurements are coming from the same subject. Uh, be nice to also show the placebo run-in uh, numbers if, if possible. So these are, the, these are the paired observations within subject and then that's projected over here to the difference axis, um, the difference in the two numbers here. So what is a statistical test that would be applicable to a two-period randomized crossover study um, when you have a continuous outcome that's assumed to have a normal distribution, or at least the, uh, the difference is assumed to be normally distributed? Well, that's a paired or one sample t-test, and we get a t-statistic of minus four because we have very consistent differences comparing drug one and drug two. P-value is 0 0.003, so we have a pretty high amount of evidence against the null hypothesis that the means are the same, and we have a 95% confidence interval minus 2.46 to minus 0.7, observed mean difference minus 1.58. So a person um, that um, takes drug two sleeps on average 1.58 hours longer, and a 95% confidence interval is 0.7 hours longer to 2.46 hours longer than a person who takes drug one. And of course, the, the 1.58 needs to be uh, treated with care because it's a point estimate and we'll have fuzz around it so the confidence interval is more important than the point estimate. Um, so let's uh, go into a little more detail in this example. Um, so it wasn't clear about the order but we're going to assume that uh, the order was randomized and of course in a, in a two period um, two treatment crossover study um, each subject is serving as their own control we're effectively adjusting for all baseline variables without measuring them. Um, and then we might have to deal with a carryover effect. So a carryover effect is an effect that carries over from one ex experimental condition to another. Um, you might have um, the, the two periods separated by a certain number of days that is, say, two half-lives of a drug. Uh, but you might not have known the half-life accurately. The half-life might be longer than you think. So you might have a carryover effect for that drug. Uh, 
you need a washout period that is a good deal longer than the half-life of the drug effect and that carryover, the time to remove carryover effects, so the length of the washout period is based on biology, not statistics. Um, you can make statistical tests for carryover effects, uh, but in a lot of cases they're not precise enough to make definitive conclusions. And as we'll talk about more, the test for carryover is correlated with the overall test of efficacy, making things very muddy. And Stevenson has shown very elegantly that if you pretest for carryover and then decide whether to break the crossover study, so let's say you have a carryover effect and you decide to only use the first period, and you the first period, for those that happen to get treatment one first versus those that got treatment two first, you now have a parallel group randomized trial, uh, but it has a lower sample size a lower effective sample size, much lower power. Um, but you're actually distorting the type 1 error for efficacy because there's a very high correlation between the carryover effect, which is a double difference, and the treatment effect, which is a single difference calculated on the same data. So we're going to uh, compare these drugs, these, these sleep medications, um, and we're going to ignore the placebo run-in in this example. Uh, the, we're going to have a suitable period of time, say five half-lives of the drug action uh, between the crossovers to wash out effects. The dependent variable is the number of hours of sleep on each drug. Uh, drug one is given to N subjects, drug two to the same N subjects, and we have the no hypothesis as before. Um, and we have our power calculation um, and then we have our collected data. Apologies, I repeated some of what we've already seen. So we're moving on to the, the specifics about the carryover effect. We're going to assume that the first five subjects received drug one first and the second five received drug two first. And if there's no carryover effect, the mean difference uh, will, will um, for drug 2 minus drug 1 is not going to depend on whether drug 2 was given second. Uh, as we mentioned a minute ago, the analysis of carryover effects distorts the efficacy analysis emphasis, uh, inference. We're, the null hypothesis here, there's no carryover effect. So we're going to rearrange the data now to clarify the structure we're using for the carryover effect analysis. And I'm not really recommending that you really analyze carryover effect because of these distortions of inference. Uh, but this will still give you a little bit of insight about what's going on. We're going to um, assume the variance doesn't depend on the order. And so we're going to do now a comparison of the differences uh, when uh, one drug was first versus when the other drug was first. But the differences are still drug 2, whatever period that was in, minus drug 1, whatever period that was in. So the carryover effect test is now uh, an unpaired t-test. It's going to have very low power. It's only five subjects in each group. And uh, we have these two means, and we have a t-statistic minus 0.86, so it really doesn't tell us anything. We can't uh, use a large p-value to be comfortable that there's no carryover effect. All we can say is there's there's nothing right now to make us reject the assumption that there's no carryover effect. You can get a confidence interval for the carryover effect. Um, so you have to be very cautious in general uh, when the null hypothesis is something you would like to fail to reject uh, because uh, the influence of the assumptions you're making is going to be very strong um, and the power is going to be low in this case. And then, as Steven Sin has warned, the correlation of the carryover effect is so high uh, with the correlation of the main effect that uh, the type 1 error, in some cases, is going to be 0.2 for the treatment effect when you really think it's 0.05. Now, what about uh, a Bayesian analysis of the same situation? Well, we're not doing the Bayesian analysis here, uh, but it's it would be reasonable to, uh, to do a Bayesian analysis and to put some structure on the problem, it's hard to think of a situation where the carryover effect would be as large as the treatment effect itself. 
And so putting prior knowledge on the carryover effect um, that would restrict the carryover effect to be less than the treatment effect would make a lot of sense. And if you go to this discussion topic in data methods, uh, you'll see discussion about that in some papers from Andy Grieve uh, that shows how to do some Bayesian modeling for carryover effect. So thanks for listening and uh, please go to data methods uh, if you're viewing this offline, add some discussion, add some questions, and I'll be looking for your questions and I'll be glad to answer them there. Uh, see you for the next session.